Hello, welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Julie Fast. She is the author of the book, Getting It Done When You're Depressed. The book now has a second edition, and in the book, she's offering up 50 strategies for people who want to achieve productivity, but may be held back by depression, anxiety, or ADHD. And I know those are heavy subjects. So disclaimer, in this conversation, we try not to take those things lightly. In fact, we try to approach them with empathy and dip into practical strategies for people, no matter how they feel in the moment. And I know that somebody who has dealt with depression and anxiety and who has been diagnosed as ADHD a while ago, productivity can be a struggle for those of us dealing with those things. So again, I'm not taking it lightly, but I will say if you are dealing with those things on any degree or level, you're going to find some help in this conversation. And these are not just pat answer type things and easy quick fixes, but the start of a conversation, the start of some help, some research, etc. So I'll just get out of the way and say, enjoy this conversation with Julie Fast. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Julie Fast. Julie, welcome to the show. Hi, it's nice to be here. So this is a topic we've danced around I think (laughs) at times on this show, we try to take a holistic approach to productivity. We, We encounter all the different kinds of tools and tips and tricks, mentalities, approaches, all of that. But, but then we also try to talk about the things that hinder our productivity when it comes from an emotional or a mental or even a physical approach or, you know, those hurdles, in other words, those blockers. And Let's just be straight. This conversation, we're going to talk about depression, and I'm very familiar with this. I've had issues with this personally myself in varying degrees in the past. It's part of what my combination of depression slash ADHD, it's kind of the, it's, it's some of the why behind my productivity interest years ago, not to mention in my family, immediate and extended. So this is nothing new to me. But it's why I was really interested in hearing the title of your book, Get It Done When You're Depressed. So I'm curious, like, could you give us a little bit of your background and why you felt like you needed to put together <laughs> these two topics of depression and productivity? Well, I have had problems with depression all of my adult life, and I knew that there's something wrong. But what I didn't know is that I also was dealing with bipolar disorder and an anxiety disorder and ADHD. So my brain just would not function like the regular brain of the people I saw around me and the way that I was raised. I would watch my cousins or the other people in my school get things done in a way that just was impossible for me. So I wrote Getting It Done When You're Depressed to help people who are in the middle of getting help for depression or anxiety or ADD. We seem to have this idea that you go get help and then you're sort of fixed, but I haven't found that. I'm now in my 50s. My depression started in my teens. I still struggle with this. I still have to have a life. I have to be there for my nephew. I have to have good hygiene. I have to get out of bed. I have to do work when I can. I want to have relationships. So I had to come up with a plan that allowed me to do the basic things in life, not the huge big things, because the big things are built off of being able to get out of bed, for example. And that's where I started. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. I mean, that's almost a, you know, we almost need to make that disclaimer up front here is that when it comes to depression, You should do any and all of what you can do to address that right up front. In other words, get the help that you can to work on it. But in in your experience and even in mine, it's not something that ever is, quote, cured in a it's gone and done and never have to deal with it again. You can work on it. You can ease symptoms of it. You can figure out systems. But there will still be those 
I don't know, just, I mean, and this isn't to be something that's negative, but there will be lapses in ground that is gained, so to speak, you know, and there's a lot of, in, in the productivity world, there's a lot of, oh no, you've got to hustle. You've got to, you know, you've got to, yeah, you've got a side hustle. You've got to always constantly be in motion, et cetera. And this is why I take this, you know, holistic approach to productivity. I think people can maybe see that now is that it's not always about that. You can talk about motivation. You can work on it. But there are times where you're just not going to feel it, and yet you still will have to get things done. And I think that's where we're going to kind of dive a little deeper in this conversation, because we want to acknowledge that depression can rob you of time, but it doesn't always have to. So the concept of productivity and hustling and being positive, I think that's great for stable people. That works really well for people who have stable brains and they can wake up in the morning and they aren't concerned about whether they brush their teeth or how hard it is to tie your shoes or all of the things that you haven't done because you haven't been feeling well. But for those of us who have more of the genetic kind of depression, that it runs in families that is more like diabetes, for example, than just not feeling well. We have to have a plan in place just like a person with diabetes does who has to deal with insulin and the food they eat, et cetera. I've always said productivity and this concept that you're going to be ready to do things and feel good about it comes after you've started a project. How do we get started? That's the main problem with our brain illnesses is getting started. And that's what my work is about. Then it sort of flowers once you've sat down, once you are able to get going. But how often do we just spend our day scrolling or not getting something done because the pain of starting is so hard? So motivation in depression is a myth. You will never have motivation when you're depressed. Motivation comes after you feel better because you finally got something done even if it's as basic as answering a few emails. And that's what I had to teach myself. And I struggle with it almost every day. Yeah. Well, and and that's the thing is what we're saying, in other words, is you may never fully get rid of it, but that doesn't mean that it needs to keep you down completely, you know? And it's it's about having that self-awareness, in other words, diving into, you talk about this, you talk into exploring your depression history to set context. So you know what you're dealing with to a point. There's so many different types of depression. So there's unipolar depression, which is the other mood disorder that goes with bipolar. Those are the depressions that are not related to anything that's going on in your life. They are not situational. You are born with it and you just have this sort of either agitation or doom and hopelessness. That's usually really helped with medications. There's no question about it. But medications don't take care of everything. But then you have the kind of depression that's either situational, it has to do with what we just went through in the last year, of course, breakup of a relationship that can completely rob you of your joy in life. And so you've got to have a plan for sitting down and doing the basic things versus this great big plan of your goals of making $10,000 a month or whatever, you know, with your side hustle. Because we can sit and plan all day long and still get nothing done. So I had to teach myself these big, long lists I was making because I I have the potential to do so much, but I wasn't doing any of it because I couldn't get the basics done. And that's the message that I want to get across. If we can't clean our house and keep our kitchen clean and be there for our kids and help them with their homework and do what we need to do, how are we supposed to do all of this extra stuff? Let's focus on getting the good things and the basic things in life done, even when we're depressed. And that's what allows us to be creative and to do the the traveling that we want and getting out in the world. We tend to skip that part of this process. Yeah. Yeah. We we tend to overlook, I think, especially with the when we have a lack of a self-awareness on our depression, we forget the effects of depression on our life and our productivity. It's so true. And so depression is doing many things in your brain, right? But one of the main things it does is it turns off your ability to reasonably see what's going on. So you're like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get anything done? Everybody else is. I went to school. I should be doing this and earning this. And you spend all of this time in that sort of alternate universe of putting yourself down and wondering what's wrong. And when I finally taught myself Julie, you are acting this way and you're experiencing this because you're depressed. Treat the depression. Use the ideas, get a system and treat the depression so that you can move forward in life. And for someone like myself who lives with chronic mental health 
concerns, though my depression is much better than it used to be. I have to use this all of the time. Also, a lot of us with depression do not respond to success very well. We can have these big goals. And then when we get there, our brains shut down and we can't get the work done. And then we start making the lists again. And sometimes we don't even do what we said we were going to do. And that perpetuates the depression. So it's the little things that I have to focus on. For me, it's sitting in front of my computer. That's the hardest thing for me is actually sitting down. I'm so unfocused. Uh, Yeah. It's not the work. The work, we have the ability to do the work. It's the getting the process set up so that the executive functioning part of our brain can be ready for us to do the work. That's why so many people with depression stay in bed all day. They're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Yeah. I I think that, uh, you know, as I was going through the book, I realized that the the book is is about depression management, but it's not necessarily a substitute for actual professional or personal treatment of depression by any means. But that the strategies in the book can aid in ongoing treatment and and be kind of a support or a structure a scaffolding i say scaffolding cuz like that's what that's you that's what you put in pr- place to start to build the building but this is maybe more foundational pieces that integrate with that professional treatment in other words How do you go get help if you can't get out of bed? Right. How do you go get help if you don't answer your phone because the phone is upsetting to you and then you think nobody cares about you. So you don't answer your phone and then people are upset with you and you don't know what to do because you're overwhelmed. And then the anxiety is just debilitating and the ADHD makes you unfocused and all people with depression have anxiety type ADD type symptoms. It is built into depression. Even catatonic depression where you're not moving, you're very anxious because you're not moving, right? So the goal is how do we change the way we look at productivity if our brains are not naturally productive? And, you know, you hear, you read studies all the time. Most people at work really only work 20% of the time and 80% of the time they're at the water cooler or they're discussing things. That's not, that's not true. People sit down at work. I watch them. They answer their email. They do their, you know, processing orders. They do their sales. They do what they need to do. They might be spending extra time talking with people, but those of us with serious depression or depression that we're getting help for in the moment, we often have trouble just doing the things that even lead to the type of work that makes us successful. So can we change the discussion around this There's no pill you can just take, right? And just automatically feel better. That's sort of rare. That happens in the really serious sort of unipolar genetic depressions where you can take an antidepressant. But if you have bipolar depression like I do, we can't take antidepressants anyway. So we have to work with mood stabilizers that then affect memory and all of this kind of stuff. I want us to get out of this idea that productivity is something that just happens, It actually is a system of hard work for those of us who don't have a naturally occurring productive brain. This is so true in in an executive functioning disorder, for example, where the frontal lobes are not working correctly. Think of all the kids who end up not doing well in school, not because they're not intelligent. It has nothing to do with it, but because they can't do their homework. And so it's not only about depression. It's about anything where the brain doesn't allow us to just sit down and work in the way that the United States especially expects everybody to do. We are, we are such a productive society here. You know, everything is about productivity. On Instagram, the amount of messages that come up that are telling me these side jobs that I need to have. Well, what if you can't do your first job? <laughs> like, you know, what, what side job am I going to do if I can't get my first job done? So that's where I want the conversation to go. Yeah. I want to dive into, obviously, the the book has so many different individual and individualized strategies that somebody that's dealing with depression, and and for that matter, even people who are lower on the you know threshold of having depression. Here's the thing. This past year, people that, it, that didn't really have issues before probably started to exhibit them. And so I want to say that a lot of what's in here is going to be helpful no matter what. But I do want to state right up front before we start diving into that, that some of these strategies may not be for you, but they might be for later. So it's it's really a matter of going through and, and picking and choosing. And again, as my disclaimer, I went in going through the book saying that it's not easy to explain 
depression to somebody who's not inside your head. It's very true. And this whole, I don't know, I just think we have this whole concept of we have to understand what other people are going through. We have to be inclusive of everybody. We have to be careful with the words we use. We have to be, you know, stigma free society and all of this. I, I find the whole discussion around mental health, even the concept of the words that we can and can't use. Very, very interesting. And I think it gets in the way of just these basic conversations about the way the brain works. When you are depressed, when you have anxiety or ADD or a head injury, which I have all of these, your brain is not going to function in the way it needs to. We have this idea that there is this brain perfection that exists and we should be able just to sit down and get those brains to work. But especially as we age and we get more head injuries and we have more problems and we have more side effects from things we do and we have more things in life, life gets harder. And that's where I have found that the ideas in the book, I wrote the book, the first edition of the book I wrote in 2006, it came out in 2008. The second edition came out this year. I still use everything in that book in the same way that I always have because my brain brain isn't changing. I'm getting better, but these are medical issues that we're talking about here. This is not trauma. And I'm not talking about physical trauma. I'm talking about, this is not about emotional trauma. This is not about abuse. This is not about personality. This is a brain that's not working well. If we're going to talk about life hacks, these are like life hacks to get the brain to work better so that you can have more productivity in your life and feel better about it. And I always say, isn't it our goal to go to bed feeling better than when we woke up? And if it means that just getting out of bed is what you need today, that's fine. That's productivity. So as we jump into the book here, I want to talk a little bit about a bunch of different pieces. We may not cover all of what I've outlined that I that really jumped out to me personally, but I want to start with the one place that is you state, don't wait until you want to do something. This is this is key because this is leveraging when you're in a good place, so to speak, or things are working, things are clicking to get things set up so that you like, it's almost like that scaffolding thing is like, if that's in place that then when I can't get out of bed or when I can, but then I don't know what to do next, or I can't start, like you said, I can start and ga- and gain momentum to get out and start getting something done. I can tell that you've been through this. I mean, I can tell that you've experienced this. And I know there's so many listeners who are going to go, yep, I, they might not even know to call this depression. But I remember, I always tell this story, when I was really sick, way before I wrote my books, way before I knew what to do, I would read books on depression and they would tell me what depression was. I believe in cognitive behavioral therapy. I think it's fantastic. I couldn't even get to that point. I was catatonic almost in my inability to take action. And I would stand, I lived in Seattle at the time, and I would stand on a corner and not even know what direction to go. That's how shut down my brain was. I was waiting for my brain to make a decision for me. But the brain is a separate part of us. We as people have to override that brain that isn't working. So don't wait until you want to do something means you have to take over from what I call the wonky brain, the brain that doesn't work for you and say, I'm going to make a decision. It's not going to feel good. I'm not going to want it. And often when I make the decision, my brain is going to tell me it's the wrong decision, but at least I've done something. And that's when my life changed. That was in the 90s when I was in my 30s. And up until that time, I let depression was not let. Depression was controlling me. It was controlling my lack of action or my actions and my inability to get things done. And then when I decided I'm going to make decisions and do things, even when it feels terrible, And even when I don't want to and wait for what comes after, it wasn't easy. It's never easy. I can tell you that. But it's a lot better than standing there getting nothing done in your life and then feeling miserable and worthless and having no money and not being able to move forward. And so don't wait to feel good. Don't wait till, all right, I'm going to, I'll get started when this feels right. It's never going to feel right when you're depressed. So you just take that first step, expect it to feel awful and keep going. This ties together a few other pieces, specific sections of the book, specifically feeling the depression and doing it anyway, reminding yourself that you're depressed and knowing when your brain is lying to you. I think those all kind of tie into each other. 
One, it's being realistic and remembering, oh, yeah, I am depressed. Two, like you were just talking about, you don't wait to do something. You, If you feel the depression and do it anyway, which I don't want to say that lightly. I want to walk the fine line of saying you can be depressed and do it anyway, but I also want to be, let's use the word sensitive or empathetic towards somebody who's feeling depressed and doesn't feel that they can do it anyway. I don't want to just say, hey, buck up and get it done. Unless you can hear that, (laughs) you know, and take it to heart or take it to your brain and say, wait, no, you're right. I do need to do that. I have been in both those places where one, if somebody said you're just depressed, you need to do it anyway, where I would have heard that and it would have helped. I've been in other places where I would have heard that and said, that's not going to help me right now. (laughs) You know what I mean? One thing to remember is that this is an internal book. This is for those of us who are depressed. So when I say feel the depression and do it anyway, that is an internal desire. I would never suggest that somebody from the outside comes in and tells us, you're depressed, do it anyway. Instead, this is a method that we, like you say, the scaffolding, I love how you say that. We have it in place so that when I'm in bed and I feel that cascade of depression because I I have a brain disorder and I feel it, I have to say to myself, there it is. Julie, you know what this is. This is the depression. You're crying a little bit. You don't want to get out of bed. You're a little, you feel a little bit of fear. That's the anxiety. But you can feel all of this and get out of bed anyway. You can feel all of this and know that if you just do a few things this morning, you'll feel a little bit better. That's the concept of feel the depression and do it anyway. Also, feel the depression and do it anyway could mean going and getting help. Instead of only lying there, I spent so many, oh my gosh, I think of the time that I spent just lying in bed or sitting in front of the television. And I still have to fight that. I still have to fight that dead feeling that I have because I have an illness and that I have to deal with. But this is an internal book. It is teaching yourself to be your own sort of internal advocate, which is there's the depression, Julie. It feels awful. I know how much you hate it, but you can do this. Keep going. That's me talking to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good note. I'm glad that you stated that because I definitely don't ever want to be the person that's exterior to somebody who is struggling with these issues and be that person who says to them, oh, well, you're just depressed. Go do what you need to do anyway, because that's just not (laughs) supportive in any way. The way that that works, because most of my work, I do a lot of my work is with parents and partners. That's my my specialty. And what I teach people is you have to avoid conversations where you're talking to a loved one's depression. So a person says, I can't get anything done. I'm a failure. I can't even do a job, et cetera. And what the loved one will do is it's OK. You're so smart. You're so talented. You could do this if you wanted. It's OK. That doesn't work. Instead, we have to directly address what's going on, honey. I can see that the depression has got a hold of you today and it is powerful. Let's focus on getting help for that depression because it's affecting how you talk and how you feel. It's an illness. Let's move forward with getting help with the depression. And that changes everything, especially for partners, because we don't talk somebody out of being depressed. We don't talk somebody out of their anxiety and we can't love them out of it either. So this is not about only about support and love and talking them out of it. It's directly addressing the symptoms that we see and getting somebody help for them. That's what I believe works. Yeah, I think that ties into also this section where you talk about working with a friend. I know that this has been for for myself and a friend of mine who, you know, works from home slash remote work, even way before pandemic times, we would leverage a coffee shop day. We, yes. we used to do this. We can't do it as much right now. We'll definitely, I'm, I'm itching to do it again, but uh, we would do that and it would be so much of a, a bolstering and a motivating and a helpful situation where we would go at some point early to mid morning, we'd get a certain amount of stuff done. We'd take lunch. We do more stuff in the afternoon. And we always knew there was somebody sitting there that we could like take a moment and talk to it was like our, we had our own personal you know private water cooler we'd see other people coming and going it was a change of scenery which we can talk about setting up a realistic workspace if you're working from home or if you're working in an office uh in a moment but it was helpful for that very reason that at any point in time i knew there's somebody else here and 
I know that they also need to get work done. And so do I. And it, it, it just it wasn't always a spoken thing. It was a lot of times it was an unspoken thing. And we'd we'd even clue each other in on if I put my headphones in. That means I'm fo- I'm hard at focusing, so it's not an interruptive time and that kind of thing. So, yeah, that that's what that makes me think of in terms of exterior help when it comes to getting stuff done. You describe that so perfectly. And one thing that I teach, cultivate stable friends, cultivate friends who can show you us, what it's like to sit down and do things. I have friends Eric, who can actually make a list and say it from 10 to 11, I'm going to answer all my email and they sit down and they answer all their email. I've never been able to do anything like that. That's impossible for me. But if I say from 10 until one, I'm going to be sitting just like you said, at a coffee shop with that person because they're doing their work. What am I going to do? I'm not going to just sit there and chat. I actually get so much more done. And I think one of the reasons that depression is absolutely exploding after this terrible time that we've been through with the pandemic is we have lost this connection of just sitting next to somebody and feeling their energy. It is not the same to do it on Zoom. It's not the same as like what we're doing right now. This is almost, you know, interviews are like a call and response. They are conversations, but when you're sitting next to somebody and you're eating with them and having coffee with them, watching what they're doing, seeing their expression, we have to get back to that. But if you can't do that, setting up a time to talk to somebody to just check in on the phone or what I do is I set up appointments so that I must be there for somebody else. And that will get me in front of my computer. And then it helps with the anxiety and I can do work a little bit better. So for example, today, as ill as I've been, I had a lot of stuff go on last year, like all of us, your interview today meant that I sat down in front of my computer earlier and did an Instagram reel which I would not have done if I didn't have to set up this interview. So working with you helped my depressed, anxious ADD brain do another thing with ease because I wasn't as worried about getting it done. So I think working with a friend or having somebody be responsible for checking in with you makes an enormous difference in the depressed brain. Now, to go back to the book being an internal thing, this is something that you probably will need to take stock of, have self-awareness of and say, who are my friends that as soon as we are able to do more face to face stuff, I can do that with and or who can I do that with now, even if even if it's not as helpful, even still instigate doing Zooms where we're not talking, we're not doing anything, but I see you, I, I, see. I hear you, you know, we can put on music and both listen to it, you know, doing a communal workspace digitally, in other words. And focusing on not what it feels like to make that phone call and set it up or that email, not focusing on, oh my gosh, I have to, you know, put some stuff on and I have to be in front of Zoom, focusing on how you will feel after you've had that time with that person. That's how we process and move forward, not being able to get things done, not being able to talk with people. Because, for example, I knew that I would never let you or my agent or my PR agent or my publishing company down today. I don't care if I had trouble getting out of bed. I don't care if I didn't want to put on my nice clothes or whatever. I will never let you down, no matter how depressed I am. And that shows you that having responsibility where you are there for others is a fantastic way to deal with your own internal woe is me. I'm really sick depression. Like you would never know that I'm not doing well today because I'm doing well while I'm talking to you. And what does that do? My tough morning and it was a tough morning, but I made it here. And by working with you, thank you. I now will have a better day. That's the whole concept of getting things done when you're depressed. By looking at you and talking with you and being with you, I'm changing my brain chemistry. Anybody who's listening to this podcast right now, they're going to have a couple hours of feeling better after it. We're affecting our serotonin and our dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, our cortisol, everything by having this interaction. My goal is how do we get to the interaction? Because that's where depression stops you, right? Once you're in it, you can talk to your friends and you can have a good time. It's getting to it. So let's encourage people to get it started 
even when we're not feeling good, because I'm feeling so much better now talking with you than I did when I woke up. <laughs> yeah. Same here. I've, I've had a lot going on having sleep issues here and there. Yeah. Occasionally there's a, there's a three forty five wake up alarm inside of my brain that just won't let go and I can't do anything about it. So I literally, I I'm like, okay, I get up, I go move to a different location. I lay down in the nice, cool basement comfort couch and uh, I get another hour and a half, two hours or more at least and then start my day. And then I, I feel tired and I felt tired all day today, but I feel more energetic now talking to you. So that just goes to show that what you're saying is true. And also you bring up something so important and that is the new research. It's relatively new. I mean, the, the doctors won their big, I think it was the Nobel Prize. What did they win? It was one of the big prizes for circadian rhythm research, right? So we now know the role of melatonin, serotonin, and cortisol in depression and in our sleep. So what you're describing of that waking up at 345, I'm so, I almost said proud, but you know what I mean? It's so amazing that you're aware that just getting up then is not going to work. So if you are using the ideas that you've created for ideas in my book or whatever system you use, which is I have to modify what I'm doing because I know how important sleep is. I know how important being with other humans is. It's not going to feel good in the moment at 345 where you have to change positions. I use a sleep podcast all night long. I wake up, if I don't have heavy sleep meds, I wake up almost 10 times a night because of just what's happening with me. I also have a brain injury. I turn on my sleep podcast, which I love. I love sleep podcast and it puts me back to sleep and I'm able to function without having to take huge amounts of sleep medicines. So look at how we are adapting and modifying after this terrible year we've had. So just hearing you and listening to what you're doing. And this is what I want to encourage the listeners of the podcast Look at how much better we feel when we even share the struggles that we have with sleep and depression and anxiety and ADD. We will never have that interaction if we don't get out of bed. We will never have that interaction if we are on YouTube all day. By the way, I have this huge television and I bought a Lazy Boy chair. It wrecked my life. <laughs> Lazy Boy chair is gone. TV is gone. I was watch. I love K-pop. We're talking seven, eight hours of going down the rabbit hole of learning and doing, and I was getting nothing done. I got rid of my TV. Wow. And then of course I moved to my iPad and my phone, but not nearly as much as lying back in a lazy boy chair, feeling depressed and watching YouTube. So sometimes you have to make really big decisions such as I'm not going to have this huge television that was almost like a movie theater because they're so cheap now, right? But it wasn't serving me. It wasn't helping me. I was lying in a chair all day. And I write the books on this and I still get caught up for a couple days at a time of what that depression does. So I love how you're modifying things and in, in order to have the life that you want. Okay. So number one, I want to get more information on sleep podcasts because I've not heard of that before. Oh. I shouldn't be surprised that that exists, but I definitely want to be able to link to that in the show notes. And then two, you talking about the TV and the lazy boy makes me think of get some exercise. That is a huge thing for me. When I don't do that, I find things just get worse and it could be as simple as walking. And again, this is another get up, not just get out of bed, but get out of the house. Or if you can do it at home, I've, I've got a stationary bike that's sitting downstairs. Now it is in front of my big TV, but that's then a, a way for me to justify. So which sleep podcast are you using? I'm curious. So I read a New York times article many years ago, talking about this new thing called sleep podcast. The sleep podcasts are storytelling podcasts. So what they do is they tell stories to put you to sleep. It's the concept of telling children bedtime stories. I use one that's very famous called Sleep With Me. And it is bizarre. This guy, his name's Drew. He's, he's known as Dearest Scooter. It's a bizarre way of falling asleep. Because he tells boring stories or he retells Star Trek The Next Generation the Great British Bake Off, all kinds. He did Breaking Bad, and he tells them in a drowsy, sleepy way. So the topic, he did Game of Thrones called Game of Drones. 
So the topic is already familiar. And for those of us who are sort of nerdy and into all of that kind of stuff, what happens is as you are going to sleep with all of the anxiety and the worry, his stories tap into your memory of watching those shows, Captain Picard or whatever, and move the anxiety and the sleep problems to the side and you fall asleep. It is a brilliant way that he has come up. He was really the pioneer of a lot of this. So I'm not talking about meditation sleep podcast or sleep podcasts that say, now it's time to go to sleep. That doesn't work for people with depression and high anxiety. We need to be distracted. So I've noticed that there are, there's, there's, all, there's one called Calm. LeBron James has done some stuff with this, Matthew McConaughey. There's all kinds of people and they read stories. You can get a Harry Potter. There's a Harry Potter podcast that I listen to that read, does Harry Potter stories. There's all, now how they get around this copyright, I don't know. But they're storytelling podcasts. That's what I'm talking about with sleep podcasts. Gotcha. And I also listen to really interesting books on tape, such as like James Harriet's All Creatures Great and Small, because it goes into my childhood and what I listen to. And it will put me to sleep because it's familiar. You, of course, listening to something destructive or awful at night, you know, like watching The Mandalorian or something, that's not going to work because it's a little bit different. But actually, I take it back because Dearest Scooter does The Mandalorian. He does the retelling of The Mandalorian. But it's in the retelling. Here's what they were wearing. Here's what the set was. Here's what baby Yoda's arm did. And you fall asleep. Interesting. It's life changing. It's life changing. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to do I, what I will do is I will uh, link up to some of these. I'll, t- I'll take a quick, you know, a quick rabbit hole down and uh, then link to some of these in the show notes for this episode. So I'm glad we spent the time on that, though. It's it's definitely worth it. I was just talking about this with a friend of mine a couple days ago, even about how we both used to listen to music since we were young, like junior high ish up till even now. And then recently in the last few years, he switched to podcasts a while ago. I only in the past few months have started to find that listening to music as I go to sleep hasn't done the same thing as it used to. And so, yeah, but anyway, I think, let's see, what else can we talk about here? I mean, we talked about getting exercise. That's something I brought that up a a moment ago. That's something that's definitely helpful. Even just getting outside and walking, walking the dog, like that can be another thing where it's like, oh, just get outside and get that dog walked, you know? And that's, that's, that's what my scenario is when mostly the other people in the house don't contribute sometimes, mainly because of school. That is also another thing that I think we don't talk about enough. When we are really sick, requirements such as taking care of an animal, it's too much for us. And as you said at the beginning, that's when you have to go get medical help for your depression. That's treatment. That's when you might have to go to the hospital. That's when you have to have your family help you and you probably need medications and you need medical treatment. But once you are at a place where the depression is not so severe that you can't function, you still are going to have to deal with depression. And having an animal, if you can take care of that animal, makes an enormous difference. I watch my mom, for example, do this with her garden. Her garden is what gets her moving and doing things. For me, it absolutely is helping others. Helping others is the only thing that keeps me going. If I didn't have my readers, if I didn't have all of my social media followers, I would have to go find something else because helping others is what makes me feel good. You have to find a purpose. And for many people, animals are a purpose. Children are a purpose. Helping others is a purpose. Depression robs you of the idea that there is purpose in life. So you have to fight through that depression and say, I'm going to have a purpose anyway because that child needs me. I helped raise my 19-year-old nephew. His parents are great, but I mean, I was there and my mother was his grandma, his nanny. I remember being so depressed that I would be with him and I would say to him, his name's David, and he was raised in my system. I'd say, David, you can see me crying right now, but that's not because I don't want to be with you. My depression is strong today. So instead of interacting with you, I'm going to watch you play. I then watched him use that with his high school friends. And help so many of his guy friends get help for depression because he watched me be depressed in front of him while still functioning, not functioning completely, crying, hardly able to move, but still there protecting him, being there for him and not making him scared of my depression. And that has made such a difference in whatever career path he chooses and who he is as a person, because depression is not something scary for him. Yeah, man. 
that makes me instantly jump to the section of the book where you talk about structuring your day like a child. Like a child. Yeah. Like a child. When your brain isn't working, you have, like you said, the scaffolding, you have to bring in some kind of structure. These interviews for me are a structure. I flounder on most days. COVID has been horrible for so many of us who have trouble with structure because as a writer and a speaker and an educator researcher, I'm alone most of the time with my work, right? So you took away my ability, our ability to go sit with our friends and to go speak to our groups and to go to karaoke and to do happy hour. Oh, my gosh. So I had to bring a structure in. And that usually means I have to talk to my agent at this time. I have to talk to a publisher at this time. It still is very, very hard, but at least I do it. But once again, it's the setup of that that I have trouble with. Once it's set up. I can do it a little bit better, but it's that setup that I want to encourage people to do and then feel better after they've had the phone call or the meeting with somebody. Yeah. Two other pieces that I think are really important are setting up a realistic workspace. You said you're, you know, you're, you're alone with your work for so much of that time. It can be a struggle though, to get yourself in front of or to that workspace, whether that's clutter or Just getting into, you know, it's like, well, if if I enter into where that space is and I sit down, then the expectation is, is I better be working, which may be hard to sit and focus to do. It's very hard. And also the anxiety component of what we have. So anxiety is all about avoidance. So if we have anxiety and work is anxious for a lot of people, we're going to avoid whatever makes us anxious because anxiety is so uncomfortable. So Being able to have, and I'm not talking about having a beautiful workspace. If you saw what I'm surrounded with, I have all my, I mean, this is a professional studio in my basement, just like, you know, just like your studio. This is, this is in our home. We don't have to go places anymore. If you saw what was all around me, because I live with clutter, but this space right here, this background, the way that I look, the way that I'm set up, what my computer is on the way that I'm filming this very professionally done. And so when I sit in front of that, I'm ready. Just like I see you now, the, of course, listeners can't see us, but you have a very professional setup. You have your microphone, you have your headset. That's putting yourself in front of something that creates a better product and more productivity. For some people, it might be a completely clear desk. My advice is create a workspace that works for you because if clutter isn't working for you, then you must get rid of it. And if you need somebody to come in and clean for you, which is so much harder because of what happened last year, but that is essential. Now for me, I'm a coffee shop worker. It sounds like you like to do that too. And I'm a library coffee shop bar. And I don't, I don't drink while I'm doing it, but I used to do a lot of work at karaoke. I used to do a lot of work at night, completely taken away when we had to stay home. So I had to find other ways to get things done. And because of that, I created the studio when I do TV work, especially I never would have been able to set this up if it were not for COVID. So that is one way of looking at, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And you have to create a space that allows you to get your work done. The other piece that then plays into that, and this even plays into the, well, how'd we say it? It was uh, feel the depression and do it anyway is the idea of setting a time limit. In other words, okay, you know what? The feeling's not going to go away. Then I'm still going to do it anyway, but I'm only have to do it for this long. This plays into another key productivity method, which is the Pomodoro method. I'm not sure if you've you've heard that before. So, So Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato. They have these little kitchen timers that look like a tomato. That's where it came from. And so you turn it for a certain amount of time. Now, the the typical amount is you do something for about 25 minutes or 45 minutes, whichever one works better for you. Then you take a 5, 10, 15 minute break, short break, get up, walk around, stretch, come back, turn it again, do it again. And you do cycles. It's like doing intervals of I only have to sit here and focus for 20, 25 minutes and then I will get to have a break and then I refresh, reset, start over. It's the same thing with setting time limits and feeling it, but saying, well, even if I'm not going to be able to get rid of that feeling, I'm still going to get something done. People are often surprised when they meet me or hear me that I only work part time. I can't work more than part time. And so because of just all of the health issues that I have, 
50% of my work day is staying well enough to be able to do actual work. I've always said that, but remember I have bipolar disorder. I don't just have depression. I have bipolar and I have a lot of other stuff that I have to deal with. If I do not do something well and productively in a small amount of time, I can't do my work. So when I sit down to write an article, for example, I have to really focus on that because I don't have the the extra time that full-time workers have, for example. So telling myself, all right, you're just going to write for 30 minutes. Guess what I found out? I could write, I could write a blog in 30 minutes. It was done because I was self-editing. I was doing it. I got it ready. I got it done. Things take so much less time then your depressed brain tells you they're going to take your depressed brain tells you that answering your email is going to take four weeks. So you don't do it for four weeks because it's going to take four weeks. You sit down and you've answered your emails in 40 minutes. And that is something that I had to teach myself. And I'm so glad you brought this up because I'm back in that trap again, myself of having so much time alone right now and being so individual because of the fact that I can't go out and do what I want. I got caught back in the trap of thinking that things were going to take longer than they actually take. And it's a good reminder of even somebody who's a professional in productivity and in getting things done. I still have to remind myself of these things all the time. Yeah. And and this pulls in Parkinson's law, which is a productivity term, which basically states that work expands to fill the time allotted. And so if you say it's going to take an hour to do something, it will. But if you say you can do it in a half an hour, Probably you could if you just said, I'm going to get it done in half an hour. One of the things that when I used to do a lot of public speaking and traveling a lot and doing all of this, I used to say, how long does it actually take to unload a dishwasher? How long does it actually take to clean your kitchen? It is shockingly, shockingly small amounts of time it takes to actually clean a kitchen. You can do a whole thing of dishes, load the dishwasher and clean the kitchen easily in 30 minutes, easily. But the overwhelmed look of what it looks like is, oh, my God, I'll never get that done. And so you pile dishes on top of dishes and the dishwasher doesn't get loaded and the stove gets dirty, et cetera. Reminding myself, Julie, just get started and it will take care of itself. And that's how I learned of doing things when I didn't feel like doing them and that my brain was the opposite of Parkinson's law. It was telling me that things were going to take 10 times longer than they actually did. But how would I know if I never got started? You can unload a dishwasher in like three minutes. It's incredible how little amount of time it takes to do it. But it'll sit there for three weeks if you listen to what your brain says. Yeah. So this goes back again to setting a time limit and and just saying, you know what? Maybe I don't get it all done. I just need to do however much I can for however much of a time limit I can right now. If I say 10 minutes to put the laundry away or five minutes to unload the dishwasher or reload it, you know, those kinds of things. And then once you start to build that knowledge or, you know, hard concrete data that then you can look at and say, oh, well, it don't now I know it only takes me so long to do that. This also helps with kids, by the way, which I'm still struggling with getting them to realize. But I will say saying one gets to unload this part and one does this part and then they both do it like now we don't hear you know, much of a front on that when it's like, please go do it. So that's a great idea. Also, there is another thing in the book that I think is important. If this truly is too overwhelming and you have the money, hire somebody to clean for you, hire somebody to do your yard because it's really not that important. And if you've got the money and it is overwhelming for you to make your bed and clean your room, hire an organizer, hire somebody to do the things for you. Because the lack of productivity you have, if you have a messy space and you're unhappy about it, you will make up for that just by hiring somebody to help you. So I recently hired somebody to help me deal with just all of my organization and I feel guilty about it. Isn't that, that's ridiculous. I have trouble organizing and I feel guilty about hiring somebody to help me organize. She loves to organize. We're doing Gantt charts and all kinds of things like this that make things so much more productive for me. But I have a brain that says you really should be able to do that on your own, even after all of these years of knowing I can't do it. So hire somebody if you need the help, yeah. if you have the money, of course, if you have the means. Yes. And, well, and as, again, disclaimer. And as we wrap up here, I want to say that this is, uh, you know, I, all the tips and tricks are, you know, strategies and little. By the way, there's way more, way more than what we just talked about in the book. But first and foremost, see if you can't get up 
and get help in whatever form you can, whether that's seeing professionally somebody digitally, you know, virtually, or if you know some places practicing things well, go do that. If you have the means, pay to get the help that you need, like you were just talking about with cleaning and or exploring other types of help. And even to the extent that you can, if you haven't yet, exploring medication, et cetera, that that has, you know, it takes a while to get it right sometimes. But when you do, a huge the, difference. it can make a huge difference. I've seen it with, you know, specifically in my immediate family. So I want to disclaimer all that, but I, I also want to direct people to get the book. So where can people find out more and dive in even a little bit deeper, get even more of a preview than what we just talked about? Obviously, it's wherever books are sold, but I want to direct people to your site. So the best way to get in contact with me is through Instagram. So I have my Julie Fast Instagram page and I do a lot of work about bipolar disorder and depression, anxiety, ADD and psychosis on that page because my specialty is called SMI, serious mental illness. But of course, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, there's a lot of independent booksellers because this is a Penguin publishing, DK Penguin Random House book. It's available everywhere. The first edition, Get It Done When You're Depressed, of course, has been phased out because the new edition, Getting It Done When You're Depressed, has two new sections for each of the 50 strategies. And one of the sections is on social media and how to manage social media, how not to get depressed. I just saw today that the big star has deleted her Twitter account because of how it's Chrissy Teigen, how enormously upsetting the comments section is in social media. And when we're depressed, we tend to gravitate towards things that are negative and make us it's just an energy thing. So there's a lot of information in there about social media. And then also I added how to talk to others about your depression. So getting it done when you're depressed, second edition is available all over the world. Perfect. All right. Well, I will make sure to link up to all of that in the show notes. Julie, it's been great talking with you. Glad that we did this. And again, I really just hope people can feel better after having this, you know, listening in on this conversation like we did, right? I know. I'm just sitting here thinking I was so down when I woke up this morning just because of life, you know, I feel so much better having just heard what you're doing in your life, just hearing about how you're dealing with sleep or what you're doing with the kids or all of this. And that is an example of how interacting and doing things and taking action can truly help our mood no matter how we're feeling. Yeah. So thank you again. Great talking with you. And uh, maybe we can do another round of this at some point in the near future. I absolutely loved it. Thank you so much. Well, that's another show crossed off your podcast listening to do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Julie Fast, and I hope that you got something out of it, no matter where you are in possibly dealing with depression or anxiety or ADHD. Just know you're not alone. First and foremost, I want you to hear that you are not alone when dealing with that, and that I hope that you heard something in here that encouraged you, got you thinking, and is helpful. And that also, if you heard something that did help you, that you would maybe consider sharing this episode with that other person you know needs to hear it. You can just hit the share button in your podcast player app of choice. And I really thank you so much for sharing and for listening. And I will see you next episode.